the mirror of the sea, and ships by the brink coming and gone, and in swish for me endure a day or two. The Franklin Stale. Landfall and departure mark the rhythmical swing of a seaman's life and of a ship's career. From land to land is the most concise definition of a ship's earthly fate. A departure is not what a vain people of landsmen may think. The term landfall is more easily understood. You fall in with the land, and it is a matter of a quick eye and of a clear atmosphere. The departure is not the ship's going away from her port any more than the landfall can be looked upon as the synonym of arrival, but there is the difference in the departure that the term does not imply so much a sea event as a definite act of entailing a process, the precise observation of certain landmarks by means of, a co of the compass card. Your landfall, be it a peculiar, peculiarly shaped mountain, a rocky headland, or a stretch of sand dunes, you meet at first with a single glance. Further recognition will follow in due course, but essentially a landfall, good or bad, is made and done with at the first cry of land ho. The departure is distinctly a ceremony of navigation. A ship may have left her port some time before she may have been at sea, in the fullest sense of the phrase, for days, but for all that, as long as the coast she was about to leave remained in sight, a southern-going ship of yesterday had not in the sailor's sense begun the enterprise of a passage. The taking of departure, if not the last sight of the land, is perhaps the last professional recognition of the land on the part of a sailor. It is the technical as distinguished from the sentimental goodbye. Henceforth, he has done with the coast astern of his ship. It is a matter personal to the man. It is not the ship that takes her departure. The seaman takes his departure by means of cross bearings which fix the place of the first tiny pencil cross on the white expanse of the track chart where the ship's position at noon shall be marked by just such another tiny pencil cross for every day of her passage, and there may be sixty, eighty, any number of these crosses on the ship's track from land to land. The greatest number in my experience was a hundred and thirty of such crosses from the pilot station at the sand heads in the Bay of Bengal to the Sicily's Light, a bad passage, a departure, the last professional sight of land, is always good, or at least good enough, for even if the weather be thick, it does not matter much to a ship having all the open sea before her bows. A landfall may be good or bad. You encompass the earth with one particular spot of it in your eye, and all the devi devi devious tracings, the course of of a sailing ship leaves upon the white paper of a chart she is always aiming for that one little spot maybe a small island in the ocean a single headline headland upon the long coast of a continent a lighthouse on a bluff or simply the peaked form of a mountain like an ant heap afloat upon the waters but if you have sighted it on the expected bearing, then that landfall is good. Fogs, snowstorms, gales, thick with clouds, and rain, those are the enemies of good landfalls. Some commanders of ships take their departure from the coast sadly, in a spirit of grief and discontent. They have a wife, children perhaps, some affection at any rate, or perhaps only some pet vice that must be left behind for a year or more. I remember only one man who walked his deck with a springy step, and gave the first course of the passage 
in an elated voice, but he, as I learned afterwards, was leaving nothing behind him except a welter of debts and threats of legal proceedings. On the other hand, I have known many captains who directly their ship had left the narrow waters of the channel would disappear from the sight of their ship's company altogether for some three days or more. They would take a long dive, as it were, into their stateroom, only to emerge a few days afterwards with a more or less serene brow. Those were the men easy to get on with. Besides, such a complete retirement seemed to imply a satisfactory amount of trust in their officers, and to be trusted displeases no seaman worthy of the name. On my first voyage as chief mate with good Captain Mac W., I remember that I felt quite flattered, and went blithely about my duties, myself a commander for all practical purposes. Still, whatever the greatness of my illusion, the fact remained that the real commander was there, backing up my self-confidence, though invisible to my eyes, being a maplewood veneered cabin door with a white china handle. That is the time after your departure is taken. <clears throat> When the spirit of your commander communes with you in a muffled voice, as if from the sanctum sanctorum of a temple, because call her a temple or a hell afloat, as some ships have been called, the captain's stateroom is surely the august place in every vessel. The good Mac W. would not even come out to his meals, and fed solitarily in his holy of holies, from a tray covered with a white napkin. Our steward used to bend an ironic glance at the perfectly empty plates he was bringing out from there. This grief for his home, which overcomes so many married seamen, did not deprive Captain Mac W. of his legitimate appetite. In fact, the steward would almost invariably come up to me sitting in the captain's chair at the head of the table to say, in a grave murmur, the captain asked for one more slice of meat and two potatoes. We, his officers, could hear him moving about in his berth, or lightly snoring, or fetching deep sighs, or splashing and blowing in his bathroom, and we made our reports to him through the keyhole, as it were. It was the crowning achievement of his amiable character that the answers we got were given in a quite mild and friendly tone. Some commanders in their periods of seclusion are constantly grumpy and seem to resent the mere sound of your voice as an injury and an insult. But a grumpy recluse cannot worry his subordinates, whereas the man in whom the sense of duty is strong or perhaps only the sense of self-importance, and who persist in airing on deck his moroseness all day, and perhaps half the night becomes a grievous infliction, he walks the poop, darting gloomily glances, as though he wished to poison the sea, and snaps your head off savagely whenever you happen to blunder within earshot, and these vagaries are the harder to bear patiently as becomes a man and an officer, because no sailor is really good-tempered. During the first few days of a voyage, there are regrets, memories, the instinctive longing for the departed idleness, the instinctive hate of all work. Besides, things have a knack of going wrong at the start, especially in the matter of irritating trifles and there is the abiding thought of a whole year or more or less hard life before one, because there was hardly a southern going voyage in the yesterday of the seas which meant anything less than a twelve month. Yes, it needed a few days after the taking of your departure for a ship's company to shake down into their places and for the soothing deep water ship routine 
to establish its beneficent sway. It is a great doctor for sore hearts and sore heads too. Your ship's routine, which I have seen soothe, at least for a time, the most turbulent of spirits. There is health in it, and peace and satisfaction of the accomplished round, for each day of the ship's life seems to close a circle within the wide ring of the sea horizon. It borrows a certain dignity of sameness from the majestic monotony of the sea. He who loves the sea loves also the ship's routine. Nowhere else than upon the sea do the days, weeks, and months fall away quicker into the past. They seem to be left astern as easily as the light air bubbles in the swirls of the ship's wake and vanish into a great silence in which your ship moves on with a sort of magical effect. They pass away the days, the weeks, the months. Nothing but a, <coughs> ga <coughs> a gale can disturb the orderly life of the ship and the spell of unshaken monotony that seems to have fallen upon the very voices of her men is broken only by the near prospect of a landfall. Then is the spirit of the ship's commander stirred. Strongly again, but it is not moved to seek seclusion and to remain, hidden and inert, shut up in a small cabin, with the solace of a good bodily appetite, when about to make the land, the spirit of the ship's commander is tormented by an unconquerable restlessness. It seems unable to abide for many seconds together in the holy of holies of the captain's stateroom. It will go out on deck and gaze ahead through straining eyes as the appointed moment comes nearer. It is kept vigorously upon the stretch of excessive vigilance, Meantime, the body of the ship's commander <clears throat> is being enfeebled by want of appetite, at least such is my experience, though enfeebled is perhaps not exactly the word. I might say rather that it is spiritualized by a disregard for food, sleep, and all the ordinary comforts, such as they are of sea life. In one or two cases, I've known that detachment from the grosser needs of existence remain regrettably incomplete in the matter of drink, but these two cases were, properly, properly speaking, pathological cases and the only two in all my sea experience. In one of these two instances of a craving for stimulants developed from sheer anxiety, I cannot assert that the man's semen-like qualities were impaired in the least. It was a very anxious case to the land being made suddenly close to on a wrong bearing in thick weather and during a fresh onshore gale. Going below to speak to him soon after, I was unlucky enough to catch my captain in the very act of hasty cork drawing. The sight, I may say, gave me an awful scare. I was well aware of the morbidly sensitive nature of the man. Fortunately, I managed to draw back unseen and taking care to stamp heavily with my sea boots at the foot of the cabin stairs, I made my second entry. But for this unexpected glimpse, no act of his during the next 24 hours could have given me the slightest suspicion that all was not well with his nerve. Quite another case, and having nothing to do with drink, was that of poor Captain B. He used to suffer from sick headaches in his young days every time he was approaching the coast. Well, over fifty years of age when I knew him, short, stout, dignified, perhaps a little pompous, he was a man of a singularly well-informed mind, the least sailor-like in outward aspect, but certainly one of the best seamen whom it has been my good luck to serve under. He was a Plymouth man, I think the son of a country doctor, and both his elder boys were studying medicine. He commanded a big London ship, fairly well known in her day. I thought no end of him, and that is why I remember, with a peculiar satisfaction, 
the last words he spoke to me on board his ship after an 18 months voyage. It was in the dock in Dundee where we had brought a full cargo of jute from Calcutta. We had been paid off that morning and I had come on board to take my sea chest away and to say goodbye. In his slightly lofty but courteous way, he inquired what were my plans. I replied that I intended leaving for London by the afternoon train and thought of going up for examination to get my master's certificate. I had just enough service for that. He commended me for not wasting my time with such an evident interest in my case that I was quite surprised. Then, rising from his chair, he said, Have you a ship in view after you have passed? I answered that I had nothing whatever in view. He shook hands with me and pronounced the memorable words, <clears throat> If you happen to be in want of employment, remember that as long as I have a ship, you have a ship, too. In the way of compliment there is nothing to beat this from a ship's captain to his second mate at the end of a voyage, when the work is over and the subordinate is done with, and there is a pathos in that memory, for the poor fellow never went to sea again after all. He was already ailing when we passed St. Helena, was laid up for a time when we were off the western islands, but got out of bed to make his landfall. He managed to keep up on deck as far as the downs, where, giving his orders in an exhausted voice, he anchored for a few hours to send a wire to his wife and take aboard a North Sea pilot to help him sail the ship up the east coast. He had not felt equal to the task by himself, for it is the sort of thing that keeps a deep water man on his feet pretty well night and day. When we arrived in Dundee, Miss B was already there, waiting to take him home. We traveled up to London by the same train, but by the time I had managed to get through with my examination, the ship had sailed on her next voyage without him, and instead of joining her again, I went by request to see my old commander in his home. This is the only one of my captains I have ever visited in that way. He was out of bed by then, quite convalescent, as he declared, making a few tottering steps to meet me at the sitting room door. Evidently, he was reluctant to take his final cross bearings of this earth for a departure on the only voyage to an unknown destination a sailor ever undertakes, and it was all very nice. The large, sunny room, his deep, easy chair, and a bow window with pillows and a footstool, the quiet, watchful care of the elder, elderly, gentle woman who had borne him five children and had not perhaps lived with him more than five full years out of the thirty or so of their married life. There was also another woman there in a plain black dress, quite gray-haired, sitting very erect on her chair with some sewing, from which she snatched side glances in his direction, and uttering not a single word during all the time of my call. Even when, in due course, I carried over to her a cup of tea, she only nodded at me silently, with the faintest ghost of a smile on her tight-set lips. I imagine she must have been a maiden sister of Miss B., come to help nurse her brother-in-law. His youngest boy, a latecomer, a great cricketer, it seemed, twelve years old or thereabouts, chattered enthusiastically of the exploits of W.G. Grace. And I remember his eldest son, too, a newly-fledged doctor who took me out to smoke in the garden, and shaking his head with professional gravity, but with genuine concern, muttered, Yes, but he hasn't get back his appetite. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. The last sight of Captain B I had was as he nodded his head to me out of the 
bow window when I turned round to close the front gate. It was a distinct and complete impression, something that I don't know whether to call a landfall or a departure. Certainly he had gazed at times very fixedly before him with the landfall's vigilant look. This sea captain, seated incongruously in a deep-backed chair, he had not then talked to me of employment, of ships, of being ready to take another command, but he had discoursed of his early days in the abundant but thin flow of a willful and valid stock. The women looked worried but stat sat still, and I learned more of him in that interview than in the whole eighteen months we had sailed together. It appeared he had served his time in the copper ore trade, the famous copper ore trade of old days between Swansea and the Chilean coast, coal but coal out and ore in, deep loaded both ways as if in wanton defiance of the great Cape Horn seas, a work this for staunch ships, and a great school of staunchness for West Country seamen, a whole fleet of copper-bottomed barks, as strong in rib and planking, as well found in gear, as ever was sent upon the seas, manned by hardy crews and commanded by young masters, was engaged in that now long defunct trade. That was the school I was trained in, he said to me, almost boastfully, lying back amongst his pillows with a rug over his legs, and it was in that trade that he obtained his first command at a very, very early age. It was then that he mentioned to me how, as a young commander, he was always ill for a few days before making land after a long voyage, but this sort of sickness used to pass off with the first sight of a familiar landmark. Afterwards, he added, as he grew older, all that nervousness wore off completely, and I observed his weary eyes gaze steadily ahead, as if there had been nothing between him and the straight line of sea and sky, where whatever a seaman is looking for is first bound to appear. But I have also seen in his eyes rest fondly upon the faces in the room, upon the pictures on the wall, upon all the familiar objects of that home, whose abiding and clear image must have flashed often on his memory in times of stress and anxiety at sea. Was he looking out for a strange landfall, or taking with an untroubled mind the bearings for his last departure? It is hard to say, for in that voyage from which no man returns, landfall and departure are instantaneous, merging together into one moment of supreme and final attention. Certainly, I do not remember observing any sign of faltering in the set expression of his wasted face, no hint of the nervous anxiety of a young commander about to make land on an uncharted shore. He had had too much experience of departures and landfalls, and he had not served his time, and the famous copper ore trade out of the British Bristol Channel, the work of the staunchest ships afloat, and the school of staunch seamen. Before an anchor can ever be raised, it must be let go, and this perfectly obvious truism brings me at once to the subject of the degradation of the sea language in the daily press of this country. Your journalist, whether he takes charge of a ship or a fleet, almost invariably cast his anchor. Now an anchor is never cast, and to take a liberty with technical language is a crime against the clearness, precision, and beauty of perfected speech. An anchor is a forged piece of iron, admirably adapted to its end, and technical language is an instrument wrought into perfection by ages of experience, a flawless thing for its purpose, an anchor of yesterday, because nowadays there are contrivances like mushrooms 
and things like claws of no particular expression or shape, just hooks. An anchor of yesterday was, in its way, a most efficient instrument. To its perfection, its size bears witness, for there is no other appliance so small for the great work it has to do. Look at the anchors hanging from the cat heads of a big ship. How tiny they are in proportion to the great size of the hull. Were they made of gold, they would look like trinkets, like ornamental toys, no bigger in proportion than a jeweled drop in a woman's ear, and yet upon them will depend more than once the very life of the ship. An anchor is forged and fashioned for faith faithfulness. Give it ground that it can bite, and it will hold till the cable parts, and then whatever may afterwards befall its ship, that anchor is lost. The honest rough piece of iron, so simple in appearance, has more parts than the human body has limbs, the ring, the stock, the crown, the flukes, the palms, the shank. All this, according to the journalist, is cast when a ship arriving at an anchorage is brought up. The insistence of using the odious word arises from the fact that a particularly benighted landsman must imagine the act of anchoring as a process of throwing something overboard, whereas the anchor ready for its work is already overboard and is not thrown over, but simply allowed to fall. It hangs from the ship's side at the end of a heavy projecting timber called the cat head in the bite of a short, thick chain whose end link is suddenly released by a blow from a top maul or the pull of a lever when the order is given, and the order is not heave over as the paragraphist seems to imagine but let go. As a matter of fact, nothing is ever cast in that sense on board ship but lead of which a cast is taken to search the depth of water on which she floats. A lashed boat, a spare spar, a cask, or what not secured about the decks is cast adrift when it is untied. Also the ship herself is cast to port or starboard when getting underway. She, however, never casts her anchor. To speak with severe technicality, a ship or fleet is brought up. The complimentary words, unpronounced and unwritten, being, of course, to an anchor. Less technically, but not less correctly, the word anchored, with its characteristic appearance and resolute sound, ought to be good enough for the newspapers of the greatest maritime country in the world. The fleet anchored at Spithead. Can any one want a better sentence? for brevity and seamanlike ring, but the cast anchor trick with its aff affectation of being a sea phrase for why not write just as well through anchor, flung anchor or shield anchor, shied anchor, is intolerably odious to a sailor's ear. I remember a coasting pilot of my early acquaintance, he used to read the papers assiduously who to define the utmost degree of lubberliness in a landsman used to say he's one of them poor miserable cast anchor devils. From first to last the seaman's thoughts are very much concerned with his anchors. It is not so much that the anchor is a symbol of hope as that it is the heaviest object that he has to handle on board his ship at sea in the usual routine of his duties. The beginning and the end of every passage are marked distinctly by work about the ship's anchors. A vessel in the channel has her anchors always ready, her cables shackled on, and the land almost always in sight. The anchor and the land are indissolubly connected in a sailor's thoughts, but directly she is clear of the narrow seas heading out into the world with nothing solid to speak of between her and the South Pole. 
the anchors are got in and the cables disappear from the deck but the anchors do not disappear technically speaking they are secured in board and on the forecastle head lashed down to ring bolts with ropes and chains under the straining sheets of the head sails they look very idle and as if asleep thus bound but carefully looked after inert and powerful those emblems of hope make company for the lookout man in the night watches and so the days glide by with a long rest for those characteristically shaped pieces of iron reposing forward visible from almost every part of the ship's deck waiting for their work on the other side of the world somewhere while the ship carries them on with a great rush and splutter of foam underneath and the sprays of the open sea rust their heavy limbs the first approach to the land as yet invisible to the crew's eyes is announced by the brisk order of the chief mate to the boat swain we will get the anchors over this afternoon or first thing tomorrow morning as the case may be for the chief mate is the keeper of the ship's anchors and the guardian of her cable there are good ships and bad ships comfortable ships and ships where from first day to last of the voyage there is no rest for a chief mate's body and soul and ships are what men make them this is a pronouncement of sailor wisdom and no doubt in the main it is true however there are ships where as an old grizzled mate once told me nothing ever seems to go right and looking from the poop where we both stood i had paid him a neighborly call in dock he added she's one of them he glanced up at my face with ex which expressed a proper professional sympathy and set me right in my natural surmise oh no the old man's right enough he never interferes <clears throat> anything that's done in a seamanlike way is good enough for him and yet somehow nothing ever seems to go right in this ship i tell you what she is naturally unhandy the old man of course was his captain who just then came on deck in a silk hat and brown overcoat and with a civil nod to us went ashore he was certainly not more than thirty and the elderly mate with a murmur to me of that's my old man proceeded to give instances of the natural unhandiness of the ship in a sort of deprecatory tone as if to say you mustn't think i bear a grudge against her for that the instances do not matter the point is that there are ships where things do go wrong but whatever the ship good or bad lucky or unlucky it is in the forepart <clears throat> of her that her chief mate feels most at home it is emphatically his end of the ship though of course he is the executive's supervisor of the whole there are his anchors his headgear his foremast his station for maneuvering when the captain is in charge and there too live the men the ship's hands whom it is his duty to keep employed fair weather or foul for the ship's welfare it is the chief mate the only figure of the ship's afterguard who comes bustling forward at the cry of all hands on deck he is the satrap of that province in the autocratic realm of the ship and more personally responsible for anything that may happen there there too on the approach to the land assisted by the boatswain and the carpenter he gets the anchors over with the men of his own watch whom he knows better than the others there he sees the cable ranged the windlass disconnected the compressors opened and there after giving his own last order stand clear of the cable he waits attentive in a silent ship that forges slowly ahead 
towards her picked out berth for the sharp about from aft let go. Instantly bending over, he sees the trusty iron fall with a heavy plunge under his eyes, which watch and note whether it has gone clear. For the anchor to go clear means to go clear of its own chain. Your anchor must drop from the bow of your ship with no turn of cable on any of its limbs, else you would be riding to a foul anchor. Unless the pool of the cable is fair on the ring, no anchor can be trusted even on the best holding ground. In time of stress, it is bound to drag, for implements and men must be treated fairly to give you the virtue which is in them. The anchor is an emblem of hope, but a foul anchor is worse than the most fallacious of false hopes that ever lured men or nations into a sense of security. And the sense of security, even the most warranted, is a bad counselor. It is the sense which, like the exaggerated feeling of well-being omnious of the coming on of madness, precedes the swift fall of disaster. A seaman laboring under an undue sense of security becomes at once worthy, worth hardly half his salt. Therefore, of all my chief officers, the one I trusted most was a man called B., he had a red mustache, a lean face, also red, and an uneasy an eye. He was worth all his salt. On examining now, after many years, the residue of the feeling which was the outcome of the contact of our personalities, I discover, without much surprise, a certain flavor of dislike. Upon the whole, I think he was one of the most uncomfortable shipmates possible for a young commander, if it is permissible to criticize the absent. I should say he had a little too much of the sense of insecurity, which is so invaluable in a seaman. He had an extremely disturbing air of being everlastingly ready, even when he seated even when seated at table at my right hand before a plate of salt beef, to grapple with some impending calamity. I must hasten to add that he had also the other qualifications necessary to make a trustworthy seaman, that of an absolute confidence in himself. What was really wrong with him was that he had these qualities in an unrestful degree. His eternally watchful demeanor, his jerky, nervous talk, even his, as it were, determined silences seemed to imply, and I believe they did imply, that to his mind the ship was never safe in my hands. Such was the man who looked after the anchors of a less than 500 ton bark, my first command, now gone from the face of the earth, but sure of a tenderly remembered existence as long as I live. No anchor could have gone down foul under Mr. B's piercing eye. It was good for one to be sure of that when, in an open roadstead, one heard in the cabin the wind pipe up, but still there were moments when I detested Mr. B exceedingly from the way he used to glare sometimes. I fancy that more than once he paid me back with interest. It so happened that we both loved the little bark very much, and it was just that def the defect of Mr. B, Mr. B's inestimable qualities that he would never persuade himself to believe that the ship was safe in my hands. To begin with, he was more than five years older than myself at a time of life when five years really do count. I being 29 and he 34. Then on our first leaving port, I don't see why I should make a secret of the fact that it was Bangkok, a bit of maneuvering of mine amongst the islands of the Gulf of Siam, 
had given him an unforgettable scare. Ever since then, he had nursed in secret a bitter idea of my utter recklessness, but upon the whole, and unless the grip of a man's hand at parting means nothing whatever, I conclude that we did like each other at the end of two years, and three months well enough. The bond between us was the ship, and therein a ship, though she has female attributes and is loved very unreasonably, is different from a woman. That I should have been tremendously smitten with my first command is nothing to wonder at, but I suppose I must admit that Mr. B.'s sentiment was of a higher order. Each of us, of course, was extremely anxious. about the good appearance of the beloved object, and though I was the one to glean compliments ashore, B had the more intimate pride of feeling, resembling that of a devoted handmaiden, and that sort of faithful and proud devotion went so far as to make him go about flicking the dust off the varnished teakwood rail of the little craft with a silk pocket handkerchief, a present for from Miss B., I believe. That was the effect of his love for the bark, the effect of his admirable lack of the sense of security, once went so far as to make him remark to me, Well, sir, you are a lucky man. It was said in a tone full of significance, but not exactly offensive, and it was, I suppose, my innate tact that prevented my asking, What on earth do you mean by that? Later on, his meaning was illustrated more fully on a dark night in a tight corner during a dead-on shore gale. I had called him up on deck to help me consider our extremely unpleasant situation. There was not much time for deep thinking, and his summing up was, It looks pretty bad, whichever we try, but then, sir, you always do get out of a mess somehow. It is difficult to disconnect the idea of ship's anchors from the idea of the ship's chief mate. The man who sees them go down, clear, and come up sometimes foul, because not even the most unremitting care can always prevent a ship swinging to winds and tide from taking an awkward turn of the cable round stock or fluke. Then the business of getting the anchor and securing it afterwards is unduly prolonged, and made a weariness to the chief mate. He is the man who watches. The growth of the cable, a sailor's phrase which has all the force, precision, and imagery of technical language, that created by simple men with keen eyes for the real aspect of the things they see in their trade, achieves the just expression seizing upon the essential, which is the ambition of the artist in words. Therefore, the sailor will never say, cast anchor, and the shipmaster aft will hail his chief mate on the forecastle in impressionistic phrase, how does the cable grow? Because grow is the right word for the long drift of a cable emerging aslant under the strain, taut as a bowstring above the water, and it is the voice of the keeper of the ship's anchors that will answer, grows right ahead, sir, or broad on the bow, or whatever concise and differential shout will fit the case. There is no order more noisily given or taken up with lustier shouts on board a homeward-bound merchant ship than the command, manned the windlass, the rush of expectant men out of the forecastle, the snatching of hand spikes, the tramp of feet, the clink of the pawls, make a stirring accompaniment to a plaintive up-anchor song with a roaring chorus, and this burst of noisy activity from a whole ship's crew seems like a voiceful awakening of the ship herself. <clears throat> Till then, in the picturesque phrase of Dutch seamen lying asleep upon her iron. For a ship with her sails furled on her squared yards, 
and reflected from truck to waterline in the smooth gleaming sheet of a landlocked harbor seems indeed to a seaman's eye the most perfect picture of slumbering repose. The getting of your anchor was a noisy operation on board a merchant ship of yesterday, an inspiring joyous noise, as if with the emblem of hope the ship's company expected to drag up out of the depths each man all his personal hopes into the reach of a securing hand the hope of home the hope of rest of liberty of dissipation of hard pleasure following the hard endurance of many days between sky and water and this noisiness this exultation at the moment of the ship's departure make a tremendous contrast to the silent moments of her arrival in a foreign roadstead, the silent moments when, stripped of her sails, she forges ahead to her chosen berth, the loose canvas fluttering softly in the gear above the heads of the men standing still upon her decks, the master gazing intently forward from the break of the poop. Gradually she loses her way, hardly moving, with the three figures on her forecastle waiting attentively about the cat head for the last order of perhaps full ninety days at sea, let go. This is the final word of a ship's ended journey, the closing word of her toil and of her achievement, in a life whose worth is told out in passages from port to port, the splash of the anchor's fall and the thunderous rumbling of the chain are like the closing of a distant period of which she seems conscious with a slight deep shudder of all her frame. By so much is she nearer to her pointed death, for neither years nor voyages can go on forever. It is to her like the striking of a clock, and in the pause which follows she seems to take count of the passing time. This is the last important order. The others are mere routine directions. Once more, the master is heard. Give her forty-five fathom to the water's edge. And then he, too, is done for a time. For days he leaves all the harbor work to his chief mate, the keeper of the ship's anchor and of the ship's routine. For days his voice will not be heard raised about the decks with that curt austere accent of the man in charge, till again when the hatches are on, and in a silent and expectant ship he shall speak up from aft in commanding tones, man the windlass.